Welcome to BTI, that's Bible Training Institute. We open the scriptures every week, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Study with us and learn how to know God as a close, intimate, and personal friend, and learn what is soon to come upon this world. Because they are learned men thinking things through. Here's the quotation. Here's what first here's a thinking man. Now, interesting enough, as we said before, this article is called the big what? Now, this lets us in that these are thinking men. Now, it says why the fall of the American empire will come by 2030. Now, what is he? Is he a pastor? Is that what he's talking about? This is a learned man. He's a teacher at the, one of the so-called universities of this day. Uh, it says Alfred McCoy explains why American power is coming to an end and lays his vision for the new global order. Now, he wrote this in 20, uh, this article rather came out in 2017. We're going to go back a little bit, and I want you to see what's happening. Now, here's what the prophet says in this book, Education. Here's this, I brought it with me today. I brought this book with me today. <laughs> here's my education. And I, I've been studying this book for some time now. I'm going to tell you something. This, this is a serious book. It tells us about what these thinking men say. Now, education is a book for that. Now, later on, you're going to find out how significant education is. When we start getting into Daniel 11 and Revelation 17, it will tie in and you'll see this, but we can't do that now. It says the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of what? Trust and authority. What type of men? Thinking men and women of what? All classes have their attention fixed upon what? Now, what are these men looking at? These learned men, they're looking at what? Events. And by them understanding events and their fields of those things that are taking place about us, they are watching the what? Strain, restless relations that exist among the nation. Well, all the nations are in good relationship. Is that right? Iran, they're happy to, to enter into a nuclear deal with America. Am I right? <laughs> They just jumped out and said, we're not trying to do that. We, we, over here in China and in India, in Japan, all over the world, everybody's in good relationship, aren't we? There's a strain, restless relation that exists among nations. And the thinking men know what that means. It says they observe the intensity that is taking possession of what? Every earthly element. Now, when it says every earthly element, what do you think it's talking about? They're watching. These thinking men are watching. Oh, good to see you, Sister Minnie. These thinking men are watching every earthly element. What do you think it means when it says every earthly? You think it's talking about uh, chromium and, 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 and those elements? Is that, no, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. What does it mean by watching every earthly element? Society. Society? The economy. The, economy? the, the weather? weather? Yes. In other words, they're looking at everything that makes up life. Every field of knowledge. Give me some fields. You gave me economy, science, health, health history, it's political scientists, government. So they're watching all these elements. And by looking at these, these thinking men, they do something. What do they do? Recognize that by looking at all this information, infant data, it says they recognize that something great and decisive is a far way. What are they saying? What do they mean by it's about to take place? That is what? That it's imminent, soon. So they're looking at the fields of knowledge in every field, whether they're looking at the weather or the climate, whether they're looking at history, whether they're looking at science, whether they're looking at mathematics, whether they're looking at a, a, a government and its relationships. They recognize that something great in the sciences is about to take place, that not just America, but what? The world is on the verge of a stupendous... Now, these men know that not by just studying the Bible. They recognize the world's in crisis by simply looking at the events and the things that are happening in the world. And they say, look, the America or the world can't continue like this. Now, is this happening right now? Yes or no? Yes. This man says this historian, one of those fields, writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now. What year is this? So he said everything that's happening in 2017 are likely to get much worse growing rapidly by what? I had this article before 2020. We looked at it before 2020. Several years ago, we, we, we looked at this article. Now, as we look at this, was he right? Based on the, uh, uh, did, it, did it grow rapidly by 2020? Was he right? Yes. 
and would reach a critical mass no later than what? Now think about what he's saying. It says the American century proclaimed so triumphantly at the start of World War II, 1939, may already be tattered and fading by what? So he's saying it may not be that we'll make it to 2030 before that crisis takes place in America. But he says it could all be over by what? Now, here's that thinking man. Here's a thinking man. Where this is what we're talking about. You remember what the prophet says? We should be praying for what? Now, I'm going to tell you something. And I told you this before. I'm going to write back on the board. I, I want this to be etched into your mind. Now, 2020 was the beginning of something. Am I right? It's the beginning of what the Bible calls the beginning of the end. Does that mean everything is just going to disappear in 2020? No. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It means that this is just the beginning of everything and it's going to get what? Worse and worse. Now, this man says that by 2025, it could all be over. He said, may make it to 2030, but by 2025, it could all happen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. In the natural order, remember what I told you for the last two weeks? In the natural order, we wouldn't make it to 2025. We wouldn't even make it to 2025. We've been showing you evidence, data, information. Now, these thinking men are looking for this. This is why it says that we should be praying for what? A few more years of grace and wish to work for the master. The prophet says that everybody should. In fact, look at Joel. Go to Joel chapter 2. Look what the Bible says in Joel chapter 2. This is what the minister right now should be praying. Every minister, every missionary should be praying these words. Look at Joel chapter 2. And I want you to notice what it says beginning in verse 15. Joel 2 verse 15. Are you there? Let us read verse 15 together. Joel 2, verse 15. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Verse 15, the Bible says, let's read that together. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Now it says blow the trumpet. Doesn't mean play a flute. Why, why, why didn't the prophet say play a flute? <laughs> that flute might calm you. You ever heard of flute? It's nice. It, it might relax you a little bit. You just kind of. But it says blow the trumpet in Zion. Continue. Sanctify a fast, call a what? Solemn assembly. Not an assembly to entertain and joke and laugh and just have a good time. Solemn assembly. Verse 16. Who should be called to the assembly? Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the there are elders smoke here. Assemble the elders. <laughs> then it says, what else? Gather the children. What did it say? Gather the what? Gather Amaya, the children. Gather Micah, gather Shiloh, gather Selah, gather the children. And so the Bible says, gather them together. What else? Let's continue. It says, and those that suck the breast, gather Abigail. <laughs> then it says, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord. Now watch what the priests, the ministers should do. Let them do what? Weep between the porch and the altar. Now later on, you're going to find out that they were doing something else between the porch and the altar instead of weeping. You know what the Bible says in Ezekiel? Now remember Ezekiel 9? Remember Ezekiel 9? What happened in Ezekiel 9? We've been studying for the last two weeks the ceiling. We found out what that ceiling was, clearer than we've ever found before as we studied the Bible. We found out what it means to be sealed. We find out when the sealing started. We found out that the Sabbath is the sign of that seal. Then we find out in Ezekiel 8, just before chapter 9, just before the sealing starts, you read chapter 8 and you'll find out what happened. You read chapter 7, it'll tell you about the pandemic first. <laughs> it'll tell you about the, the, the worldwide pandemic in chapter 7. In chapter 8, it tells you after that pandemic, in chapter 8 it says that they will turn their back on the sanctuary, the temple, and face the east. And worship the, Sun. what was this, the type of that? After that pandemic, what's coming? Sun, Sun worship. The mark of the, beast. we studied the, that mark of the beast and the seal of God uh, last two weeks. Then we found out that after that is in laws passed, that starts the decree, that pressing, the stamping, the sealing. And then chapter 9 starts. After that Sunday worship is brought into view, chapter 9 with the sealing begins. It's laid out in order. Chapter 7, chapter 8. Chapter 9, in type. It says, but it says that they should have been weeping between the porch and the altar, but it says why they should have been weeping, they were worshiping the sun. And God said, that's enough. They reached the limit. 
Now, Joel 2 says that they should be between the porch and the altar saying what? Spare, Spare thy people. What, what's the prayer? Father, give them a little more time. Help us, Lord. We're not ready. The ministers, the missionary should be saying, dear God, we're not ready for the seal. We're not ready for the time of trouble. We're not ready for this. We don't want to waste the time. But please, Lord, spare us. Give us a little more time. Give us a few more years of grace. Help us so that we can do something, that we can understand the time to know what Israel ought to do. This is what God wants. Now, we found out that this says how America will collapse by what? 2025. And historians going through the same thing. Now, watch what it says. It says, let me back down to here. It says, despite the aura of omnipotence, most empires project a look at their what? History. And watch what he's doing. He's not saying that, that the obviously you just make up hocus pocus and you, you put the crystal ball together and you read the future. That, that's not what it's talking about. It says, when you look at empires and you study their what? History. It should remind us that they are fragile organisms. What's a fragile organism? Uh, uh, empire. Uh, delicate, yes. But the, the, what is fragile is the, is the empire, the government. So delicate is their what? Ecology of power. Now, when you talk about ecology, you're talking about how everything fits together. Like you're talking about ecosystem. You know, it's the, the plants deal with the, the, the ground, the ground with the birds, and the birds with the water. If you mess up one, the whole thing collapses. So delicate is the e ecology of power that when things start to go truly bad, empires regularly unravel with unholy speed as a sudden destruction. The final movements would be rapid ones. Just a year for what? Now watch what he's doing. Watch what the man is doing. Watch what the historian is doing. He's saying if you look at countries and governments and empires and you watch when they reach their critical state, look at how long before they collapse. Is he making up these numbers? No. What is he looking at? Exactly. History. It says just a year for Portugal, two years for the Soviet Union, eight years for France, 11 years for the Ottoman, 17 years for Great Britain, and all likelihood, 22 years for the United States. Counting from the crucial year of what? Now, see, you got to understand what happened in 2003. You see, we, we, if you understand history and prophecy, all this makes sense. Now, let me ask you a question. If I, if, he's, if I go to 2003 and I add 22 years to that, what is that? 25. Oh, wow. This says, watch him now. For future historians are likely to identify the Bush administration as the year of the start of America's what? I'm going to tell you something. And they are right. Yes. I'm telling you something. My teacher before he was dead. I remember. And I remember in, 19, in the 1990s when Bill Clinton was president. I remember my teacher. He was studying on Daniel 11 and Revelation 17. And he said, Bill Clinton, as he goes down, George Bush will be the next president based on Daniel 11 and Revelation 17. I, was, I sat and watched. Listen. Before Bush was even, uh, the son Bush was, was even known. Then I, I, I woke up on the year 2000 and I got the newspaper and where Bush won. And you remember, it wasn't an ordinary win. Do you remember what happened? Do you remember the count and the recount? It was the, 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 and he was called, I remember my teacher was bringing out, he was not the president elect. He was the president select. He was selected. Uh, uh, you remember, they, they had already, had, what was the other man's name right now? Um, Al Gore, he had already, Al Gore had, was already celebrating the victory. They had already had, had, had pronounced him the winner. But when you woke up in the morning, Bush was the president. And everybody said, what? And they recounted the votes. They, they, they recounted them, they recounted them. And recounted them. And then finally, the concession speech was made by Al Gore. But see, this was prophecy. Now, it says, this was the, and I can't go into that right now because it's going to take me off. But, but the point is, in 2000, uh, if you go back into Bush, when Bush, George Bush, the junior, uh, came into the scene, this started the downfall. 2001 was a part of this, the September 11 attack. But anyway, so it goes on. But have no doubt, when Washington's global dominance finally ends, there will be a painful daily reminders of what such a loss of power means for what? Americans in all walk of life. Now watch, watch. Available what? Economic, educational, 
and military data indicate that when it comes to global power, negative trends will aggregate rapidly by what? Now remember, now, now remember, now remember this article now. Let me back up this article. I did I put it on there. Now, can you see that? You can't fully see that? 2010. Now, the other article was written in 2017. This article was written in 2010. Seven years before that, 10 years before 2020. And watch what he says. Now, this, same, this is the same article from 2010. Now, watch what he says in 2010. Available economic and military data indicate that when it comes to U.S. global power, negative trends will aggregate rapidly by what? This is 2010. And are likely to reach a critical mass no later than what? 2030. Now, what making him doing that is because he calls himself a prophet. He's looking at the fields of knowledge and he's looking at what? Data. Information. He's looking at all of this. And he says, look, analysts say by what? 2025, you won't, U.S. won't be a top world power. U.S. intelligence agencies have concluded that the United States is likely to lose its dominant global position in the coming years with economic and political power shifting to countries such as what? China and India. You remember these names? And India and China and Russia and in the cities of America. Talking about getting ready for the Civil War. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's never going to happen the way they say it's going to happen. They're looking at the fact that America is demising, the Bible tells us that's going to happen. But what's going to happen is as America begins to demise, in order to not lose her demise, she says, I will do anything to reclaim or re to retain my power. And guess what the devil's going to tell her? There's only one thing. See, God is upset with you. Look at the homosexuality that was done. Well, what, was, what was the day of that birthday? <laughs> June 26. Not there, you know, just right there. June 26. On June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court passed a decision that a national same-sex law would be accepted. They're going to talk about this. The, 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 the devil is going to trick the world uh, using true and false. You're going to say, look at the immorality. Look at all of the, the base debauchery. Look at the, the governments and the politicians. Look at the corruption. Look at the storms, the climate change. Look at all the environment devastation. Look at all the political governments. Look at all this. And a God is upset. With America because America has left God look at the Supreme Court that as they uh, uh, just getting ready to turn the sway from the liberal mindset that has been perpetuated perpetuated upon it now all of this they gonna say look we got to bring America back to God look at the abortion and they're saying the only way to do it America's not gonna choose to come back to God we've got to mandate her come back to God how's how they gonna mandate it a national Sunday law to save America. You know, there's a, there's a movement now called Save America Now. And they go through all of what I'm talking about. The history, looking at the morality, looking at all this and saying, we've got to get back now. It's moving towards something. Now, it says, the, that, uh, let me back it up so you can see it. Uh, th that assessment outlined in the what? How many have ever heard of global trend? Global trend. Uh, this global trend was a report that the think tanks for America and Europe came together and they looked at what was happening in the trends, what was going on in the world, and they came up with this document called Global Trends 2025. Report by the National Intelligence Council contrasts sharply with the conclusions of a similar study released by the same agency just four years ago. The earlier report projected continued U.S. dominance through the year what? They are, all these reports are being done, but how come we don't hear about these reports? We're so busy that we can't see it. But, they're, they're, but these are reports, I guess what? Available. They're available. We can look at them. Now, my brothers and sisters, what should we be praying for right now? Praise. We should say we are not ready. We are not ready. God wants us to get ready. What do you say? Amen. We're going to stop right here. We're going to say a word of prayer, and then we'll get deeper into our study. Do you think that we're in trouble right now, yes or no? Now, this is not something that we're just being poured out of the sky. This is information. This is history. And God is trying to tell us, please, we should be praying, Lord, spare us just a little longer. There are people who have not heard this. Right here in America, right here in the Seventh Adventist Church, all around the world, people are starving. You know, people are gathering around their computers, gathering around there trying to find food. And so sad to say, on YouTube, you can find not only good food, guess what you can find? 
you can find trash. And people are watching trash right now. Can you imagine? Most churches have been shut down for a year. Can you imagine not going? Do you know what would happen if you were to start church immediately back at right now? People wouldn't even go. See, we're habits of creature. When you start doing something habitually, and you know how the person wake up now, next, the, the next Sabbath is trying to go back. You know what? I was more comfortable not going to church. It was comfortable just staying home. We just have worship and we do various things. We wear whatever clothes we want to wear and just eat and have a good time. Why go back to church? It is the devil's plan to systematically rob us from spirituality. And he's doing a successful job. And we've got to pray to God, Lord, help us. Because people are watching. And do you know this little church is open not just for us. This little church is open so that around the world people can hear and understand you are helping others right now. The decisions that you are making. You know people all over the world are, are, are asking, how could I study this? How can we understand this? How can we get ready for this? This, this lesson, I wish we were there to, to study. What must the people be getting that they're studying? Can you imagine they're wondering how good you are doing as a result of studying these things? <laughs> but by the grace of God, I want to be a part of this team that God used. What are you saying? We're talking about this evening. We want to try to finish up. I don't know how far we're going to get, but we've got to understand how to get this rain. We we're talking about the science of receiving the latter rain. We stopped on the ceiling for a moment because they all fit together. So before we jump into that more deeply, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Those that can. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, if ever there was a time to wake up, it is now. If ever there was a time to clean up, it is now. And if ever there was a time to be prepared to stand up, it is now. I plead with you, dear God, that you would please grant us your Holy Spirit. Give us an understanding intellectually and move us and motivate us so that in our hearts spiritually, we will come up to the help of the Lord. And will be used to receive the seal and to receive the latter rain and to give the loud cry and to finish the work on time. Abide with us now, we pray. Remove me, Lord. I can do nothing. I need your spirit. The congregation needs your spirit to understand here and through the Internet. We pray, Lord, that you'll do something special, that we will grab our Bibles and not just sit like we're watching the theater. But that we will study and pray to get ready for ourselves. Please hush the mouths of those who are being distracted and let our minds see Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can study the science of receiving the rain because we need you right now. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. Let us take our Bibles and go to Daniel chapter 12. We're going to Daniel chapter 12. And we want to notice what the Bible says in Daniel, the 12th chapter. Now, we have proved that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. That everything in the world is in activity and agitation. The constrained, restless conditions among the nations. We have seen that we are moving at breathtaking speed toward the final crisis over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We studied this. We notice that this crisis that is developing in us is going to bring a time of trouble such as never was to every nation, to every continent, to every country. We found out something serious, severe is coming that we have never witnessed before in any lifetime. Now, how do I know that the Bible tells us that something is coming that has never been witnessed in any lifetime? Is that in the Bible? Yes. Where in Daniel 12 am I going? Verse 1. Let's look at it. Look at Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. This is at the end of the 11th chapter prophetic prophecy. Now look at chapter 12, verse 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now notice what happens when he stands up. And there shall be, what everybody? A time of what? Trouble such as? So what we're watching in 2020 is the development and the brewing of a time of trouble such as never was. Now, are we ready for this right now? We're not ready for this. And God's goal is to get somebody ready for the time of trouble such as never was. This is God's goal. Is he going to do it? Yes or no? 
He's going to do it. Now, it would be well for us to spend a whole hour or a week studying just this time of trouble that's coming. But that's not our subject this morning. We've looked at this for about a year in coming events class. That's not our study. What I'm interested in us better understanding this morning is not that a time of trouble is coming. That, that's solemn. That's significant. But to understand how can we go through this time of trouble? How can we be prepared to meet this time of trouble? That's what I want to study. Do you want to study that? Yes. Now, does the Bible suggest here that there's going to be somebody that is going to pass the time of trouble? Yes. Let's see. Let's, let's continue Daniel 12. It says there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. That's true. Let's continue. Since there was a nation even to that same time. But notice now. At what? That time. Talk about the time of trouble. At that time, thy people shall be what? So the Bible tells us that in the midst of that time of trouble such as never was, that God is going to have a people that will be delivered. A people that will go through it. It says that everyone that shall be found written in the book. So in order to go to be a part of that people that are, are go through the time of trouble, we have to be written in that book. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be a part of that people? Yes. That's the team that God's going to use to give the loud cry. That's the team that God's going to use to be prepared to stand. That's the team that will get the experience necessary to wake up the entire world. That's the team right there. I want to be a part of that people. Now, does the Bible anywhere else signify who these people are that are going to be protected and go through this time of trouble. Does the Bible anywhere else signify that? Where? Revelation. Revelation. Good, good. Revelation what? Seven. Now let's go to Revelation 6 first though. Go to Revelation chapter 6. You're right. Now do you know that when you study the Bible, Daniel and Revelation have to be studied together. You can't understand Daniel without Revelation. And you can't understand Revelation without the book of Daniel. They go together. Now look at Revelation. And speaking of this time of trouble such as never was, the Bible speaks of that same time of trouble in symbolic language as the winds that are about to be let loose. And in Revelation chapter 6, notice what it says, beginning in verse 14. We'll start off with Elder Smokey. Would you read that for us, please? Revelation 6 and verse 14, please. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. Let me back you up, excuse me, to verse 12. Let me back you to verse 12. What seal is he? What seal is this? Six. Now, question: How many seals does this book have? Seven. So the six seals. Is this something at the beginning, the middle, or the end? The end. If you talk, if you come to the sixth day of the week, which is Friday, that's not the beginning of the week. That's not the middle of the week. You know what you call that? The week end. This is the end of the week. So the sixth seal is dealing with prophetic events under the end of time. Now he speaks of these events of the the earthquake that took place in 1755, in verse 12. He speaks of the sun that went uh, 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 black as sun cloth of hair, verse 12. He speaks of the moon that became blood, all this, 1780. Uh, uh, you see all this happening. Then it says, in, in the heaven departed as a scroll, uh, verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell, 1833. All this history. Then it says in verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain, and what else? Island, Island were moved out of their place. Now listen. This was way back in the 1800s. After 1844, shortly after that, Jesus wanted to open the scroll and come back. But you know what? We weren't ready. We read and uh, talked about the reading of the early writings, 38, 40, where Jesus was getting ready to come in the 1880s. But then God saw that we were not ready. And it says that Jesus then looked back at the remnant and saw they were not ready, looked back to the Father and said, my blood, my blood, my blood, give them just a little more time. Then the angels were sent, this angel was sent to the four angels saying, hold, 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 that you read about in Revelation 7. So probation was getting ready to close, but we were not ready. So God then extended probation so that a people could be ready. But guess what? He cannot extend it forever. There is a limit. And in 2021, we are nearing that limit today. Now look at what it says in Revelation 6. Jumping down now to verse uh, 17, Elder. What does it say in Revelation 6, 17? For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stay? John the Revelator saw it. My teacher used to say that John was there. <laughs> My teacher said that he saw it with vivid eyes. That John, he had a little bald head on the front. And little hair just whipping in, in the back. And the wind blowing behind him, whipping as he's doing it. And he said that if John, he was looking at what was happening and said, Woo! <laughs> but John looked at this and he, he recognized Christ was coming all over the world. And he saw that it didn't appear as if nobody could stand. He says, Lord, 
They, they are running to the mountains and to the rocks. The kings, the great men, the bond, the free. It seemed like everybody was running. Nobody was ready to appear. He says the great day of his wrath has come. And he asks the question. Who shall be able to what? Stand. Who shall be able to stand? My question is, will you be able to stand? The answer is given in chapter 7. And after these things I saw what? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2. And I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal, seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. Where? In their forehead. Question. Who is it that's going to stand? Those that are sealed. Who is it that's going to go through the time of trouble? Who are those people of God? How will God know and discern who are his? Those who have the seal. So we studied the sealing. We found out that in order to be ready, we need to sit. Now I'll come back to this and read this another time. I can't go through this right now. We'll come back to this and read that. It's important, but we'll come back to it. Now, so then, what is the question of utmost or greatest importance? How do I get the seal? We found out that the seal is in the Sabbath, but just knowing that the seven days of the Sabbath doesn't give you the seal. Doesn't do that. And so we found out the question of greatest importance, uh, utmost and greatest importance is how do I get the seal? Go to Ezekiel 9. What book did I say? Do you remember Ezekiel 9 began to start talking about this sealing? After chapter 7, the pestilence and talk about that. After chapter 8 and talk about the sun, worship. In chapter 9, it says that God says, no more. I can't spare anymore. Spare not. Remember, the ministers have been crying. What? What did they should have been praying? Spare the people. But God said, my eye cannot spare, neither will they have pity. No sparing now. The limit had been reached. Chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9. Look what the Bible says. God calls the men with the destroying weapons in his hand. Verse 2 says, six men came from the way of the higher gate. Ezekiel 9, verse 2. Six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lie toward where? Where does it lie toward? And that's key. It lies toward the north. Now, we can't study that right now. But remember, now in Daniel 11, you have the king of the north and you have the king of the south. There's a reason for this. But anyway, historically, there was a reason for that. And prophetically, there's a reason for that. But they come from the way of the, uh, of the north. And every man has not a weapon in his hand. And it says, and one man among them, one of the six, did not have a destroying we weapon in his hand. One of them had in his clothes with linen, had what? Talk to me, somebody. With a writer's what? Ink horn by his side. Now, that tells me then that there were six men. Five of these six had destroying weapons. One of these six had what? A writer's what? Now, what do you do with a writer's ink horn? You write. You sign. You seal. Now, so then Ezekiel 9 tells us he had a rising on by his side. Verse 4. Let's read verse 4. Let's read that together. And the Lord said unto him, the one that write his ink horn, go through the midst of the city, through the midst. Now, watch. Watch for a moment. Are they sealing outside of Jerusalem? No. Where does only the sealing happen? In Jerusalem then it will be key for us to understand what Jerusalem is. Because if you're not in Jerusalem, no seal. Somebody says, well, I better get a plane and go to the Middle East. No. That's not being Jerusalem in 34 AD. There's a spiritual Jerusalem. And we've got to understand this. Now, you will find when you read Daniel 11, the king of the north says that, that the Satan enters into the glorious land, which is Jerusalem. But it's speaking of something prophetically. So now we've got we to put all this together, but we're not there yet. Now, the point is, he goes into Jerusalem. If you're not there, then you don't get the seal. He says, go through the midst of Jerusalem, verse 4, and set a, what everybody? Give me another name for Mark. So the seal of God or the mark of God or the seal of Satan or the mark of Satan. What is the mark of Satan? The mark of the, so it's one of the two. 
Now, watch what it says. Let's continue. This right Zingon has, he's gonna, he says, he's going to mark uh, the men uh, upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done where? In the midst thereof. Now, question. Do you want to be marked with the mark of God or sealed? Yes or no? Yes. Then who do you need to seal you? The one with the writer's what? Well, I wonder what marks or seals. What does the marking or sealing? Ink. The ink. If you have pen and you put a mark on, on, on a paper, it's not the actual pen, the plastic pen that's marking. You know what's doing the marking? The ink. When you're writing, write down your notes. That's ink that's on that paper. You can rub your, 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 your pen on it. The plastic, that's not what it's doing it. It's the ink. So what we need to get marked or sealed, we need the what? Ink. Is the ink solid or liquid? It's liquid. <laughs> You're not following this thing. <laughs> what is the ink? Go to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to the Bible. Isn't it wonderful to be in Bible Training Institute where the Bible can explain everything you believe? It's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in the Bible. You don't have to say nothing. You just go text upon text. Now look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3. We want to begin in verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 2. Let's read that together. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. Now, we're trying to find out how to get sealed. That's the greatest thing we can get right now. We found out that the writer's ink horn, that man who has that, does the sealing. What is actually sealing us is the ink. What is the ink? 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, Sister Minnie, would you read for us verse 2? 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, please. Wait a minute, written, because we want the, the, the writer's written in corn, the written in corn, or the writer's in corn. So watch what it says, that we are his epistles. Notice what it says, written where? Continue, my sister. In their hearts, known and read of all. So where does God want to write on us? Where? Where? Our hearts. Our hearts. Amen. All right, praise God. Verse 3. Watch what it says in verse 3 now. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Now watch. Watch. Written how? Not with ink. So what is this New Testament ink? Talk to me, somebody. Let's read it. Written not with ink, but with what? With what? With the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of what? Of the heart. Question. So then what is this ink that is to mark or to seal us? Talk to me. The spirit of the living God. This ink is the the Holy Spirit. So then in order to get the seal, we have to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, is that elsewhere in the Bible? That the ink, or rather the, the sealing, is done by the Holy Spirit. Let's check our answer from the Bible. Let's check our answer. The Bible says in everything we believe, there should be at least two or three witnesses. We see the witness telling us this, but are there any more witnesses that we can call to the stand to vindicate this case? Am I? Let's go there. Ephesians where? Uh, Ephesians All right. So this is Corinthians. Go over two books. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1. Where in chapter 1 do we want to read in the book of Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 1. What verse? Good. Let's see. Now, would you read that for us then, Amaya? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Now, once we heard the gospel of salvation, watch what happens. Continue. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed. Ye were what? Sealed. How? With that Holy Spirit of promise. So what seals us? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, again and again and again, the same testimony. Is there another a verse that says this? Give me another verse. Give me another verse. We saw it in Ezekiel 9. We saw it in Corinthians 3. We saw it in Ephesians 1. Give me another verse. Chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at Ephesians 4. If I were you, as a good student in Bible Training Institute, I would link my verses together. If I was in Ephesians 1, I would write down on Ephesians 1 the next verse. That way, every time you're there, it will jog your memory. And as you keep going through it, it's written in there. It's, that's right. It's, it's in the Bible. So look at that. 
so that then we can transfer it and we'll get it into the Bible, into the mind, into the heart. He wants to write it there. Now look at Ephesians 4 and we want to look at verse 30. Sister Davis, would you read that for us, please? Ephesians 4, verse 30. What does the Bible say? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. We're trying to find out how do we get sealed? Who does this sealing? Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So who seals us? Talk to me. The Holy Spirit. Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, in order to receive the seal, we have to really learn how to receive the no Holy Spirit, no seal, no seal, no protection, no protection, no going through the time of trouble, no latter rain, no loud cry. So you can begin to start seeing that everything depends upon God getting the people ready to receive the seal. When we go to church, that's what we should be understanding. How can we get this seal? Now, question, where does the sealing take place? Out of court? Where is it finished? Where is the sealing completed? Finished? Out of court? No. Holy place? No. Most holy place? Yes. Now, how do you know? How do you know that the sealing, now you have enough evidence to know it. I, I, I wanna, we never said it this way, but I want to make sure you, you're calculating it properly. How do you know that it is in the most holy place, that that is the place where the sealing is completed. That is where the law is, Sister Davis. Praise the Lord. Why is that important, anybody? Why, why is it important to know that's where the law is? Because the seal is where? In the law. Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say that the seal is in the law? This is, this is a BTI. You can't, you can't just tell me seal is in the law and smile. No, you got to give me some Bible. Isn't that right, Sister Colleen? <laughs> they smile at me saying seal is in the law. Give me some Bible for that. Isaiah 9. Not, not 9. Isaiah is right. Isaiah is, is right, but not 9. Isaiah what? 8. Let's go there. Let's go there quickly. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah 8. Isaiah the 8th chapter. Now, you're going to Isaiah 8, and I want you to see this. But now, look, if I had a stamp, if I had a literal stamp, I cannot seal a person unless that stamp, I'm brought in contact with that stamp. So you got to come where the stamp is. Am I right? Oh, yes. So if the stamp is in uh, Georgia, then you got to go to Georgia. If the stamp is in Virginia, you got to go to Virginia. So wherever the stamp is, that's where you got to go in order for it to be able to stamp you. Now watch what the Bible says the, stamp, the seal is. Isaiah 8, look what it says. And Isaiah 8 and verse 16. Isaiah 8 verse 16. Would you read that for us as well, Sister Davis? You got this one. I'm get, this is a good one for you. Isaiah 8, verse 16. What does it say? Now slow down. Seal what? The law among my disciples. So where is the seal? God sealed his what? Law. So if God, if I want to get the seal, where would I find the seal? In his law. So then where would I need to be if I'm going to be sealed or stamped? I must be where the law is. Where the stamp is. Where is the law? Out of court? No. Holy place? No. Where? No. So that tells me then that the only people that get sealed or completes the sealing process are those who make it into the most holy place. Later on, we want to find out how to get into the most holy place. You know, you don't get into the most holy place just by thinking there's a most holy place. There's a way to get in. And we're going to find out how to get in by the grace of God. Now, question. That can you go... Can you go into this room anytime you want? No. no. Once, a year. Once a year. That's right. When is the only time you go into that room? So what does that tell me? That the sealing takes place on the day of atonement. This is key. Oh, this is good. Man, this is good. This is good to you. I mean, this is good to me. Listen. That tells me, see, it, we were studying that we were studying the day of atonement. And it looked as if we left our study of the Day of Atonement. We start talking about the rain, early rain, latter rain, the shaking, the sealing. And it looked like we left the Day of Atonement. But brothers and sisters, we find out that you can only be sealed on the Day of Atonement. It is on this day that you're sealed. And do you know that they knew this anciently? They didn't understand it in the antitype, but in the type they understood this. Let me show you. Let me show you this. Here, I'm going to show you a Jewish encyclopedia. We read this before. Now things that we've read before is going to come clear to us as we look at it. Here's a Jewish encyclopedia. 
talking about the Day of Atonement. I'm going to blow it up so you can read it, but this is the Day of Atonement. This is what it says on the Day of Atonement. Let's read it together. It says, the former is the annual day of... So they knew the Day of Atonement was a day of what? They knew it was the hour of judgment. It says, when all creatures do what? Pass in review before the... Give me another name for searching. Investigating eye of omniscience. It says three books are what? Did we study those three books in this room? We studied these three books. I open on the first day of the year. Uh, the destiny is suspended until what? The day of atonement when the fate of every man is. So when did the sealing that they, they knew took place? When did it take place? On the day of atonement. Watch it now. Same Jews encyclopedia. God is seated on his throne to do what? Judge the world. Opening the books of the great trumpet is this is the day of as a shepherd must of his flock causing the pass on his rod. So does God cause how much every living soul to pass before him to do what? Fix the limit of every creature's life and to foreordain its what? When on the day of atonement. It is sealed. Who shall live and who shall die? So when is probation closed? On the day of atonement. Sealed. Eternal destiny decided. Day of investigative. Does that sound like something? Yes or no? Now I want to ask you a question. Do the dead. Do the dead receive the early rain do dead people receive the rain no. do dead people receive the latter rain no. so then this is talking about what needs to happen with the what the so then the key is to find out when judgment passes from the dead to the, the this is when the ceiling takes place this is when the eternal destiny takes place now what event Allows us to know the bell and the pomegranate. What event allows us to know when the priest moves? What event? Now you know why now because remember in order to be stamped, what do you need in order to stamp? You need what? Pressure. Press. You cannot impress a stamp unless there's pressure. What brings pressure to Sunday worship? What brings pressure? The law. You remember we read in Esther, we read in the book of Esther that what brought pressure, it actually used those words. It says it was the decree that pressed the commandment. So what is needed to happen on the day of atonement in order for the stamping to start on the day of atonement is a decree that brings pressure. So 1844, the day of atonement started, but the pressing ceiling did not fully start uh, stamping because no pressure. So when, after 1844, on the Day of Atonement, should we look for the stamping and the pressure to start when there is a passing of a what? National Sunday Law Decree. I then saw the third angel. Said my company angel, fearful is his work. Now what is the third angel warning against? Remember the third angel? Revelation 14 verse 9. It says, if any man worship the what? Beast and his image and receive his. Who's marked? The mark of the what? So now, so that third angel warns against the beast's image and the mark of the beast. It says the third angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He, the third angel, is the angel that is to do what? Select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. So what message shows us when the sealing begins? The third angel. What event is this bringing to view? The mark of the? The time of the marking. The time of the sealing. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Are we together? Yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, will the day of atonement go on forever? It says time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointing to the earth and saw that there would have to be a what? Getting ready, getting ready among those who have late embraced the. Now, now you are not. That's us. We see now that their angel is telling us we need the seal. But in order to get the seal, there is a what? A rain. So that means that when we wake up to see this, it's time to what? Yes. Clean up. And that cleaning up is to begin to identify what is in our lives that need to do what? 
come out. And what is not in our lives that needs to come in. We have to study this. It says, I saw, it's get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world. And we're going to prove this than we have ever yet died. I saw two things. What did she see? I saw that there was, number one, a great, great work to do for them. And number two, but what? It's a what type of work? Great work? So what are the two things we begin to study? Great work, little time. You see why we studied that several months back. So we've got to understand, put it all together now. The, remember the pieces of the puzzle, we've been dumping them out. Now we continue to arrange them. So it says, I saw there was great work to do for them, and but what? Now, do we have forever to do this work? No. There's a time limit, am I right? Yeah. I wonder if 2025 is approaching that time limit. So we've got to study and put it in our mind to understand what's taking place. Now, I want to ask you a question. This great work, what is it? What is this great work? Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus? So what is this great work? To look like Jesus. But now listen, listen. The great work, I'm going to say it another way. You tell me if I'm right. The great work is to get the seal. Yes. Those who are protected in the time of trouble and receive the seal of God must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Early writing 71. So it's saying the same thing. Are you following what I'm getting at? To look just like Jesus is the only way we can get the seal. So now my brothers and sisters, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, there's not any seal or mark that can be seen, mere not the 200. But a what? Settling into the truth, both intellectually and what? Spiritually, so they cannot be removed. Now, we begin studying this. We looked at all the text that proves this quotation. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that something must happen where? To our what? Mind. To our mind, intellect. And something must happen to our heart, spiritually. An experience must take place. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know when we're studying right now, God's trying to change our intellect. He's trying to help us to intellectually understand from the scriptures, truths, that are helping us to understand how to finish the work so that nobody can move us from this truth. Amen. We're going to come to a place, and I'm going to, you told me you want me to be honest. See, we've been, we, we've been, we've been feathering you with a feather, <laughs> but we got, to get, we got to get straight. Is that all right? Yeah, you okay? You all right? <laughs> but I remember now, I, and I told you, now listen, I remember one of the first times I said, and I, I sat down and I heard someone preach from the pulpit, and I heard it said something about death before. You may not even heard it. But I heard, when I sat down, I heard uh, 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 the, the minister. Now, I'm not going to say who the minister is, some of you know. But I'm not going to say who the minister was, not the minister we have now. But the, the minister said that Desmond Ford and his teachings were correct. And you know what I did when I heard that? I cringed internally, internally. <laughs> I smiled externally. And then I gently looked around. I'm being honest with you. You, know, you told me you want to be honest, right? <laughs> and I looked around to see, did anybody understand what they heard? And you know what I saw? Just kind of just. And I said, well, praise the Lord first. <laughs> because see, if it just went right over your head, then that means it didn't really go into your heart. Are you following me? But then I said, Lord, how are you going to do this? Because I know this is your church and I know that you want us here. And little by little, God began to arrange the situation. Am I right? Now, now we're going to go back. I'm going to read to you what Desmond Ford said, and I'm going to let you tell me why I cringed. Now, now, now that you've been studying for a year and a half, I want you to look back at this thing that you looked at before, and I want you to tell me what you see. Not because I say so, but because the Bible says so. The way to know this truth is not because of what a man says, not who the man is, but what does the Bible teach Amen. to the law and to the testimony. I don't care who the man is. If they speak not according to this word, someone says, well, he may be the president of general. I don't care who that man is. I say it respectfully. Well, he may be the pastor. You're going, you better be quiet. Pastor may put you. I don't care about that. What does the Bible say? Amen. What does the Bible say? Now, watch now. It says we got to be settled so that nobody can move us. I've been at places where everybody disagree with me. Men in a country where, where the entire church, I don't want you here. Why are you telling us this? I said, well, I never go anywhere. I'm not invited. So you invited me. I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> I remember we finished one meeting. Man, it, the smoke was clearing in the room. Smoke 
blasting. We are now, we went to a question and answer. They, they were almost getting ready to shut down the, no more meetings. But they said, at least let's do a question and answer. I said, I don't care. We, we go to the Bible. I said, what I say is not what I say. Don't you believe the Bible? Isn't that our position? So let's go to the Bible. And I said, you're going to ask any question you want. And one of the person said, first, one of the first questions came out, a woman was in the back. She, she got up. You could see the flame in her eyes. You had a fire coming out of her mouth. <laughs> she said, you know when a person really upset, they can't even fully form their word. How did you get in here? Who brought, who brought you? Who gave you the authority to say what you said? Where did you come from? And by the grace of God, we went to the Bible and I said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord. I said, now, if I am wrong, show me from Scripture. And if I am right, then close your mouth. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the issue. Now, guess what? That same woman upset, but she could not answer from the Bible. No one else could answer from the Bible that it was wrong. Later on, that same woman that was upset, she began to start studying. She said what that man said was right. Even though it agitated me, it made me hate. She rose up against it. She said, but when she went back to scripture to prove it wrong, all she could see is evidence that the evidence that says right, she got baptized. Amen. I've seen people when they start off saying, I hate you for telling us this straight truth. Why are you troubled us? Why can't you just let us go to sleep? I can't let you go to sleep. My teacher used to say, you can't sugarcoat the message. That's what my teacher told me. You can't sugarcoat the message. He said, look, the people already have diabetes. <laughs> so you cannot sugarcoat it. <laughs> so we have to have it straight and plain so that by God's grace, we can understand it. And you know, some of the same ones saying, thank you for giving the message. See, when you find an animal that is trapped in a, uh, a trap, you know, like a bear trap or a dog trap, you see an animal trap. If you try to go over and touch it, what would it do to you? Bite you. Why? Because they hate you? He's hurting. And that's the way he's expressing his hurt. And if you get close enough to him, you, 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 you get bit. So what do you do if you're intelligent? My teacher taught me. You know what you do when you're intelligent? You first just stand there and just smile at that little animal. Then after a little while, let him smell you a little bit so he can get to know you. Throw in a little what? Food. Not that, not, don't fill them up yet, just throw them a little food. <laughs> give them a little nugget. <laughs> not a chicken nugget. Give them a, let me say, give, give them a principle. <laughs> throw a little, go, go a little principle of truth, you give it to him. And then after a little while, the dog gets a little more comfortable, the animal gets a little more comfortable until they learn we can trust this person. Amen. They're not trying to hurt us, they're trying to help us. And then you can get close enough to guess what? Open the trap and free the person. Amen. This is our work. Amen. When you go to a place or church, don't get upset at people. Don't get upset at the minister. He, we're going to find out later on why the ministers are teaching what they're teaching. We're going to find that out. We're going to find out that, the, that, 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 that from the ministry, the help is not going to come like that. I'm, we're going to prove this. Now, I know sometimes ministers take offense when I say, but I show them from the Bible. It's right there. Right in the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to show you. But now, many will obey. Many ministers are faithful, but are afraid to stand for truth. I remember at one church we were doing a meeting and the minister said to me at the, at the, middle, middle, of the middle of the meeting, he said, look, everything you're saying is true, but I can't preach it. He says, if I preach it, I'll lose my paycheck. I said, okay, I'll preach it for you then. It's all right. <laughs> this God is more interested in life than paycheck. Amen. A shepherd is not thinking of his own life. Amen. A true shepherd is thinking of the sheep. That's right. But a hireling, he will flee when the wolf comes. But a shepherd will give his life. Do you see? Now, let's go a little further. It says we got we to gotta get to a place where nobody can move. I don't care how many people. I don't care how many people are against us. We stand upon the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It says just as soon as we come to that place, guess what's going to come? The shaking, it will come. So God is trying to get us ready to this place. Now, is there a limit, yes or no? Yes. What is, well, let me, before that, what is God's strategy called in these final hours? Because it looks like we're going to fail. It looks like the church is losing. What is, God, what is God's strategy called? Talk to me, Micah. The loud cry. <laughs> Even a child can understand this thing. Praise God. So Satan's strategy, uh, God's rather, God's strategy to finish his work and upset the devil, loud cry. Does Satan have a strategy? Yes. What is the name of Satan's strategy called? The Omega of Apostasy. 
There was an alpha and there's an omega. We're not there yet, but I want you to keep having this in your mind. Now, before you understand what the omega is, we're not studying that. We have a whole study on just the omega of apostasy. But before you understand what that is, you've got to understand what it's for. See, if you don't understand what it's for, knowing what it is, it's not going to make much sense. What really is the omega for? What really is Satan's strategy about? Is it strategy about, uh, is it strategy about having God in everything? No. Is it strategy about having God not in everything? What is really Satan after? See, once you understand what he's after, then you will better understand what his objective really is. Sometimes he masks his objective. So Satan's game plan, I have a little there. Do you see what that says? You know what running clock means? Yes. Run the timeout. If you were playing basketball and you were up by three points and the team that you're fighting is a better uh, team that you're playing against is a better team, you don't try to shoot. <laughs> you don't try to shoot. You know, you know, the coach will tell you, you get ready. Shoot. Coach, don't shoot. <laughs> the coach will, now hold, the, hold the ball. The coach will be fighting at you. Don't shoot that thing. So now, what would he tell you to do? Run the clock. Run the clock. Until the time runs out. Now the question is, what does it mean to run the clock? Now look at it now. Here's a sanctuary. Great work. Little time. Little time. Half time, 31 AD. What does it mean to run the clock? What is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? He's cleansing the sanctuary. The only thing that can uh, cause Satan to be destroyed is to bring Jesus out of the most holy place. And so the only way to keep the clock running is to do what? Keep Jesus in the most holy place. Now, please, please write this down. Zero this. Circle this. You know, somebody teacher say this is going to be on the test. Listen, this is going to be on the test. <laughs> Satan's game plan is very simple. Keep Jesus inside the most holy place until the time limit runs out. Great work. A little time. That's his whole plan. That's his whole plan. He doesn't even have to think about trying to defeat God because he can't. He was cast out of heaven like, as easy as a child can cast a pebble to the earth. The Bible says that Satan was kicked out of heaven. My brother says he cannot win by force. He has to win by technicality. And if he can keep Jesus in the most holy place until the time runs out, he will win by default. This is his plan. We studied this in, a, in, in, in our study on the game of life about a month or two ago or two months ago. So now, my brothers and sisters, why does he not want Jesus to finish the work in the most holy place? Why does Satan not want Jesus to finish the work in the most holy place? Why doesn't he want him to finish? He want his head because he knows that if the priest finishes, what is the next thing? If the priest finishes his work in here and cleanses the sanctuary, blots out sin. If he comes out, his next move is to take those sins and put them on the head of the scapegoat and crush his head. And then Satan will be completely annihilated. And Satan's afraid of that. He studied the plan and he says, I've got to do to keep Jesus in the most holy place. Now, did he wait until the most holy place to do this? No, no. When did he try to keep Jesus from getting in there? The, even before he was born. In the outer court, long before there was ever a seed. And once he heard Genesis 3, 15, begin to understand the sanctuary, he began to try to, try to see. When you start studying through the Bible, you'll start seeing this. In the book of Esther, how, how many people did, 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 did uh, 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 Haman want to kill? But you know what the Bible says? It doesn't say all the Jews just like that. You know what the Bible says? All of the seed. Why? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy he knew that the seed was going to eventually bruise his head. He said, if I can kill and annihilate this seed, nothing can destroy me. So that's the whole history behind why the Jews have completely tried to be destroyed from the very beginning. But what he did not uh, understand was that uh, with that seed moved just from the Jewish nation and moved to spiritual Jews. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, watch what happened. It is, what is Satan's game plan? We found out. Run the clock. I'm not going through that right now. You, you got the, the principle. Now, he wants to prevent the Day of Atonement from coming to and he knows what happens at the end of the Day of Atonement. He had a strategy. Now, question. If that is a strategy... That's not the first time he tried. When he was born, what did he do to try to stop this from happening? What did he do? He tried to kill all the babies. And you can, you can follow this all the way. What was the cross really about? The cross, Satan set up the cross to try to what? Kill Jesus. But Jesus took that defeat and turned it into a victory. 
That's our Lord. Amen. You can follow this all the way through. You see that the dark ages with the papacy was to try to stop Christ's work in the sanctuary. Luther, reformers rose up so he can continue this. But now listen. So the Omega is not his first attempt. The Omega is Satan's last attempt to keep Jesus inside of the most holy place. Once you understand that, then the game is set for you to figure out, well, then what would it take to keep Jesus in the most holy place? Once you fully understand that, then you will know what the Omega of Apostasy is. Now, let's go a little further. We got to uh, what? Well, let me ask you that. Let me ask you that first before I say that. What would be necessary to keep Jesus in the most holy place? What would, what would be necessary to keep Jesus in the most holy place? To do what? Sin. Keep Sin. the people of God. Where? Sin. Keep the people of God in. Sin. If he can keep us sinning, then Jesus would have to stay inside of the what? So what is our basic problem then? We love sin. Yes. But even more basic than that. Go to Proverbs 29. Go to Proverbs 29. Let's go more basic than that. Look at Proverbs 29. In Proverbs 29 chapter, we want to see what our basic problem is. In Proverbs the 29th chapter, notice what the Bible says. In Proverbs chapter 29, and we want to look at verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Satan has studied this. Praise God. Is the Bible good, brothers and sisters? Yeah. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 18. Would you read that for us, Sister Kia? Proverbs 29 and verse 18. What does the Bible say in verse 18? So the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people do what? Yeah. Now watch now. What do you mean by vision? Now look what the prophet says. Christ's object lesson is 34. It says, Christ's what? Mission was not understood by the people of what? So what was one of the basic problems in Christ's day? They did not understand his mission, so they did not understand his vision. If I have a vision of what I'm going to do, what do I mean by my vision? my vision? So sometimes a business will say, here's our vision. The business will tell what their vision is. What is the business's vision? That's their mission. What their plan is, what their goal are, what they're trying to accomplish. In other words, without a mission, the people do what? Perish. So it says Christ's mission was not what? Understood by the people of his time. The man of his coming was not in accordance with their expectations. The Lord Jesus was, was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy, the whole sanctuary system. Its imposing services were of divine appointment. They were designed to teach the people that at the time appointed, what was going to happen? One would come to whom those ceremonies what? Give me one of the ceremonies that pointed to Jesus. Pentecost. Give me another. Passover. This was the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. It says one would come whom those ceremonies pointed, but the Jews had exalted the forms and ceremonies and had lost sight of their what? Give me another name for object. Mission. Give me another name for mission. Vision. They had lost sight of what the vision was for. What their mission was. The traditions, maxims, and acts of men hid from them the lessons which God intended to what? So my brothers and sisters, what we have to do and go back now is find out what was Christ's mission because you're going to find out that Christ's mission then is the same mission right now. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we can find out what his mission was yesterday, we know what his mission is today. So let's find out what, what, what let, well, let me ask you, what was Jesus' mission? Because he did a lot of things, am I right? Tell me some things Jesus did. Give me some things he did. He did he heal the sick? Did he have a medical missionary program? He did. What else did he do? He raised the dead. What else did he do? He fed. Did, did he feed hungry people? What else did he do? Did he give any marriage counseling? Yes, he did. Did, 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 he, did he any family counseling? Yes, he did. You can go through the Bible and see all the things he did. But question, was that his mission? No. He had one mission. What was his mission? Because it was not understood by the people of his time. And I say today, it's not understood when? Today. To save the lost, that was part of his goal, but that itself is still not the full mission. If, if only saving the lost was it, we'll find out the lost can never be saved. <laughs> that sounds funny, but yes, that's true. Yes. The cleansing of the sanctuary, yes, that's true. But I, wanted to, I want you to say it in a different way. 
Let's go to John 4. Let's go to John 4. Let's go to John 4. Let's, let's let Jesus tell us. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. This is Bible Train Institute. We're going to read the Bible. I'm going to let you tell me. I see a hand going down. <laughs> John chapter 4. We'll read the text first and then you tell me. John chapter 4. Let Jesus tell us what his mission is. He did many things. But what was his singular mission? What was his singular mission? We're going to John, the fourth chapter. And we want to begin in verse 32. John 4, verse 32. Sister Chanel, if you'll read that for us, please. John 4 and verse 32. What does it say? He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Remember he was talking about, he was at the well. The disciples left to get him food and he was hungry and thirsty. The woman at the well came. He solved her problem. He gave her some counseling, marriage wise. He helped her spiritually. But let's continue. And he goes on to say, continue. You can tell they didn't understand. <laughs> They're like, did somebody bring him food while we were gone? Who, who, who brought him take out? You know, but in the next verse. Jesus unto them, now he's trying to explain to them what his mission was, what I was really saying to them. My meat. What was his mission singularly? Finish the work. That was the mission of Christ. To do what? To finish the work. Now he has left us an example that we should follow his steps. What should be the mission of the Seven Adventist Church? This was Christ's mission. So somebody said, well, how could that be Christ's mission? And then that be the same our mission unless those works have two parts. One in the outer court on earth. And one in the sanctuary in heaven with his two rooms, the holy and most holy place. Now, let's go a little further. This says to finish his work. Question, go to John 17. Now, John 4 is the beginning of Christ's ministry. John 17 is not the beginning of Christ's ministry. John 17 is the end of his ministry. I wonder what's on his mind. You know, somebody said, you got to have variety. We got to have variety. Well, let's see what's on Christ's mind. John 17. Look what the Bible says in John 17. Beginning in verse 3. John 17, verse 3. If you will read that for us, uh, Mother Parker. John 17, verse 3, please. John 17, verse 3. If you were blessed by this study and would like to be a part of the BTI, that's Bible Training Institute, simply have your Bible pen and paper handy and check out our weekly studies by logging on to molministry.com. Hover over sermons, then from the drop down, click the word video. Also, tune in every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the latest. Maranatha.